What Jesus will we believe in? Today I'm going to talk about an old pop song, the thought of the Stanford philosophy professor René Girard, and about the enigmatic gospel message of the parable of the tenant farmers. Fifty-two years ago today, in the middle of the Vietnam War, the former Beatle John Lennon released his second solo album, Imagine. The title track was the best-selling song of his entire solo career. He says, he sings, Imagine no possessions, I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger, a brotherhood of man. Many regarded it as an anti-religious statement because there's that part in it that says, and no religion too. But John Lennon insistently objected to this criticism. In fact, he said that someone had given Yoko Ono and him a prayer book and that this gift inspired him to write the song as a kind of positive prayer. John Lennon said, quote, if you can imagine a world at peace with no denominations of religion, not without religion, but without this my God is bigger than your God thing, then it can come true. Today, as new war erupts in the Middle East, we are talking about how this kind of peace can be true. What would happen if instead of seeing human flourishing as the result of producing ever more consumer goods, our goal instead became true peace among all peoples and the creatures of the earth? How would we even do this? We'd certainly need to begin by understanding our situation as human beings. The 20th century French philosopher Simone Weil suggests that the Gospels are a theory of humankind even before they are a theory of God. And this philosophy of humanity has its roots in the Hebrew Scriptures. So let me begin with Richard Compion's old joke. Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments and the people of Israel come and they say, how did it go? And Moses says, well, the good news is that I got him down to Ten Commandments. <laughs> the bad news is that adultery is still on the list. Even Richard laughed at Richard's joke. And it's a good one because it talks about the Ten Commandments in a way that we can understand. It expresses that understanding of the Ten Commandments as a kind of burden, a restriction of our freedom and autonomy, as if God were trying to stop us from always having so much fun down here. My friend Matt Bolton says that instead, these are not arbitrary prohibitions, but, quote, loving limits that guide us toward justice, grace, and dignity. Through the law, Israel's relation to God becomes tangible. It makes ethical behavior a kind of calling. Now, the 20th century Stanford philosopher, philosophy professor René Girard also regards the Ten Commandments as a central um, statement about the truth of human life. As a co very complicated beings, so much happens in our subconscious that we do not fully understand ourselves. We don't know what it is that we're going to do next. Someone, we surprise ourselves constantly in how we respond to circumstances. And we also do not know what it is that we really want, what we desire. And so as Gerard says, we look around at what everybody else is doing, and that helps us know what it is that we should be desiring. And we imitate them. He calls this mimetic or imitative desire. And yesterday at the Saturday yoga practice, I was practicing yoga on the labyrinth right there, and I love that practice. The beauty of so many people all gathered together, shaping their bodies, some very athletic and some not so in the same way. There's something very beautiful about it. So I'm going to give you a picture of what it's like. So the instructor says, keeping your right foot back, move your left foot to the top of your mat, put your left hand inside your left ankle, extending your right hand, rotate your trunk toward the right. That's an actual instruction. And so everyone in there looks at what everybody else is doing, and we're all kind of brought in, in into, into line with one another. And Girard says that our desire is like that too. We learn from others. But he points out that desire through imitation can frequently lead to violence. 
Conflict arises from rivalry, from wanting what other people have. In contrast to ancient myths which justify sacrifice and view the world from the standpoint of the crowd, the Bible reveals this uncomfortable truth about human nature. It shows us the world from the perspective of the victim. Now this concern for the victim becomes the absolute value in all societies molded by the spread of Christianity. And this is where the Ten Commandments come in. According to René Girard, they're not just a guide to living. They are entirely devoted to one idea, prohibiting violence against our neighbors. You shall not kill, commit adultery, steal, bear false witness. He says the Tenth Commandment, you shall not covet, that that is the one that's more important than all the others. And it's unique too. All the other commandments um, talk about forbidding an action, thou shalt not. But this one forbids a desire. You shall not desire the house of your neighbor, the spouse of your neighbor, nor anything else that belongs to another person. Now, because human beings are naturally inclined to want what another person has, there is an inherent instability in all human groups and families. And if left unchecked, this rivalry would permanently endanger the survival of all human communities. So Girard points out that this view is in opposition to the one assumed by the social scientists. They see the world as one in which peace and mental health and balance are the norm and that conflict interrupts that norm. Girard believes that conflict is the normal state and that at every level when a human society is struggling with um, tension or scarcity, there's a, ten a tendency to relieve this stress by scapegoating individuals and groups. So we feel better when we solve our problems by blaming someone else. And this is a deep part of our human nature. It's not just something that just evolved or something that's recent. It's been true of human beings as long as we've understood what they were. Gerard points out that Jesus offers another possibility, a different way of living than that rivalry or fighting and wanting constantly what other people have. Rather than merely shifting the power so that a different group subjugates the others, God becomes the victim. The kingdom of God strives to create a community in which no one is dehumanized or left out. One notable thing about Jesus is that he does not seem to be in the business of prohibition. Jesus doesn't go around saying, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Instead, he cares about presenting a model, a way for us to imitate that we can begin to flourish in our own lives. He promises that we can be like him in our relation to one another and in our relation to God. So Jesus' teaching and the way he lives focuses on God's plan to establish a community of love and joy. And you may not think much of it, but here you go. Here's one example of it right here. And I see so many examples of people caring for each other, looking. The last thing that someone said before I walked in the room was, I brought back the communion kit because I was visiting my friend and we prayed together. That was the last thing that happened. There's so many invisible things that are happening. As we care for each other, we care for the world. We too can be part of that kingdom of love and joy, the kingdom of God, which overturns our ordinary imitated desires for power, prestige, and possessions. So this is the third part, the last part of the sermon. So we're almost there. We're like the, tick, the little tape for the race is just ahead. Huge crowds gather and greet Jesus as he comes into Jerusalem for the last time. And you, it's the Palm Sunday scene. He goes to the temple and he, he begins teaching in the temple. And the religious authorities, they take exception of it. They see how popular he is and they're threatened by it. And as human beings, we are hard to teach. We're, we're very um, defensive. We are um, likely to um, want to, to um, make excuses for our own behavior. And so Jesus tells a story just for the religious leaders. And he uses uh, an example of another kind of story that comes from the Old Testament. And the story is the story of Nathan, the priest, who gives advice to David, the king. So you can imagine how that is. David, the king, has um, had an affair with Beersheba. And then he's um, exposed her husband to danger at the front where he was killed. So he engineered her husband's death. 
And then um, he took um, that Uriah's wife, um, Beersheba, his, his own wife. And so Nathan tells King David a story, and the story is about a man who had a tiny lamb, and the man loved the lamb so much that he would even sleep with the lamb at night, and he had nothing else but this lamb, and he cared for it and loved it. And then his neighbor, who had hundreds of flocks of sheep, not just hundreds of sheep, hundreds of flocks of sheep, came and took that man's one lamb and slaughtered it for a feast. And as soon as King David hears this, he says, that man deserves to die. And Nathan says to him, you are that man. And this is the exact same thing that Jesus is doing as he's telling the story about the vineyard. Isaiah in, the chapter, in chapter 5 talks about Israel as being God's vineyard. So they would completely understood and known about that. In Jesus' story, similarly, the owner plants the vineyard, puts in a wine press, digs a, 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 um, puts up a fence, builds a tower. And a few years later, at the time of the harvest, he sends his slaves to collect the rent. They beat one, kill another, and then they stone the last to death. And he sends even more slaves, and they do the same thing. The New Testament scholar Herman Weichen regards these as symbol, symbolic of the early prophets and the latter prophets. And so the owner, instead of just going and bringing the angels of heaven to bear on them and destroying them, he sends his own son. But they covet the man's inheritance, and in their greed, they cast out the son and of, out of the vineyard and murder him. And uncharacteristically, Jesus tells the story, uncharacteristically, Jesus doesn't explain the story. He says, well, what do you think of the story? And as is the case with Nathan and David, their answer is a kind of judgment on themselves. They say, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at harvest time. Now notice that's not what Jesus said, right? That's what the religious leaders of the time said. And the irony is that Jesus tells a story about greed-based violence and that the religious leaders hate the story so much that they respond with the same kind of greed-based violence against him. They are the ones, they say, God will punish um, his enemies. But in Jesus' story, God keeps sending more people. God sends more servants until finally God sends even his son. And for the temple leaders, either we subjugate our enemies or they do the same to us. But in Jesus' story, God's longing for us never ceases and always finds a new way to effect peace and reconciliation. Human beings deny and torment and kill God's child. And yet, in the end, God forgives even them. So what Jesus will we believe in? The, my God is bigger than your God, who only loves our own tribe and promises that we will replace our enemies at the top of the pyramid? Or will we trust in the surprising reversal of the crucified God who dies so that all people might be free and live in peace? When we look around at the world, we should not be surprised by conflict at all levels, from the family to the nations. These arise out of a desire for what other people have. We should also expect the normal human response, which is to try to reduce tension by scapegoating individuals or groups. The Bible reveals this truth about the world and helps us to see from the perspective of the victim. And Jesus offers the promise of another way. By imitating him, we become free of the desires that ruin us. We become part of and help to create a community of love and joy. And wherever we go, we bring the freedom of love and share the good news that no one is beyond the reach of God's forgiveness. These days, I keep thinking about that utterly idealistic song by John Lennon of him imagining no possessions and singing, you may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you will join us and the world will live together as one. Through God, may this become true.